We must make the hard choices to reduce the cost of health care and the size of our deficit. Yes, we must make hard choices to reduce the deficit. But although the president said that, he doesn't propose hard choices. He doesn't cut much of anything. And in his long inaugural address Monday, he mentioned debt <coughs> once. He basically dismissed it the next sentence, saying, we reject the belief that America must choose between caring for the elderly and investing in the next generation. Apparently, no choices need be made. The government's Santa Claus. But we can't afford Santa Claus. I'm grateful to Grover Norquist of Americans for Tax Reform. He got many politicians to pledge not to raise taxes. Good. Taxes are high enough. And it was thought that the tax limits would starve the beast. The beast being Washington, and beast is a good term for Washington, but starving the beast hasn't worked. Even tax-cutting politicians just keep spending. And as Milton Friedman taught me, spending is a far more accurate gauge of government's burden. Every dollar government spends is a dollar taxed away from someone. If it's borrowed, it sets the stage for higher taxes later. If government prints more dollars to fund spending, our purchasing power falls. It's all a tax on our future. Instead of politicians pledging not to raise taxes, what we really need are politicians pledging not to raise spending. And now, finally, we've got that, thanks to Jonathan Bidlack at the Coalition to Reduce Spending, which came up with this Reject the Debt Pledge. So tell me about that. Yeah, well, the pledge basically asks candidates to commit to three things. One, that they'll only vote for balanced budgets. Two, that they won't vote for any new spending that isn't offset elsewhere in the budget. And three, that they won't vote to increase borrowing or, or the debt ceiling. And anybody sign it? We did. We had 24 candidates who signed. Uh, two who We ended, just started this year? We did, this election cycle. Uh, and so the two who were elected were Senator Cruz from Texas and Doug Collins, uh, a representative from Georgia. But that means most of them lost. True. Well, I mean, obviously this is uh, not something that's easy to sign, right? It's very easy to say you're not going to raise taxes. It's another thing to say that you're not going to vote to increase borrowing or, or continue spending. I'll sign it, though I don't count here because I'm not a politician. But I get the part that says, therefore, I pledge I will not vote to authorize or fund new programs without offsetting cuts mm -hmm. in others. But this uh, one, I will not fo vote for any budget that's not balanced. That seems unrealistic because... You don't need to balance the... If you just slow the growth of government in 10 years, you could get us out of trouble. But balanced That's right. budget's not realistic. Yeah, I mean, the budget is a blueprint, right? So the budget is not the be-all, end-all. I mean, the big problem is that we haven't even passed the budget in the last... Or the Senate hasn't passed the budget in the last three and a half years. So, to be honest, that plank of the pledge is in the current political environment less relevant than the other two. And no incumbents have signed the pledge. That's correct. So Ted Cruz is now an incumbent, so... I think That's you're... right. And Ted Cruz, for all we know, w w could end up being a great fiscal conservative senator. He could end up being a completely unfiscal conservative senator. But at least now we have him on the record to the point where if he ends up voting for unbalanced budget, if he, if he votes for new, new spending programs, voters and the press and activists can actually hold him accountable. A Fox News poll uh, asked people, Government spending is out of control or managed carefully. In 2009, 62% said out of control, but by this year, 83%. So why is, if people think that, why is it so hard to cut? Well, I think part of it is that people don't have a mechanism. They don't know what they can do to actually solve the problem, right? If you ask the studio audience here, maybe this audience isn't the most representative sample, but... No. If you, went, if you went to a coffee shop around the corner and you said that, you know... Well, they're not representative either. This, maybe, is, this is true. <laughs> this is true. If you went to a coffee shop in some other place <laughs> and you asked, if you said, you know, you're making $5,000 a month, but you're spending $10,000, what do you need to do? The average person's not going to say, well, I need to go to my boss and ask for a $5,000 raise. They're not going to say, oh, I need to cut out my Starbucks. They're going to say, I need to fundamentally reassess what I'm spending my money on. So people get that in their personal lives, but they don't always make the connection to the political sphere. And part of that reason is because they don't have a mechanism to hold people in the political sphere accountable when they don't act in the way that they would in their own personal lives. And that's why I think the pledge is important. And the other reason maybe the poll misleads is that everybody says, yeah, let's cut spending. Right. But when you get to the specifics, should it be defense? Should it be Medicare? Should we kill the drug war? Then people, oh, people, no, you can't. 
except these people. But you know what? It's surprising. Rasmussen did a poll last month that showed that 48% of Americans believe that everything in the budget should be on the table as a means of balancing the budget. So that's, that's the highest that that poll has ever shown. It was something like a 4 or 5% increase from the last time Rasmussen asked the question. So when you talk about it in the context of the debt, people start to get that we have a spending problem. Thank you, Jonathan Bidlack. Hope lots of people sign this thing. Next, the audience gets to ask the questions. We're back with your questions for my guests. Mark Meckler, who founded the biggest Tea Party group, the Goldwater Institute Starley Rhodes. Daniel Garza, who wants immigrants made legal. And Jonathan Bidlack, who wants politicians to pledge not, not to increase spending. So who has a question here? My question is, when do you think the government will get serious about cutting the debt? What will it take, basically? Uh, riots, <laughs> chaos in the street, <laughs> massive inflation. I think it's going to take a change in incentives. The problem is that for elected officials right now, if you think about would they want to cut spending or would they want to increase spending, all of their incentives are on the side of increasing spending. They have lobbying groups that are pushing for various pieces of spending. Um, so there needs to be something on the other side, right? And everybody who comes to Washington, they aren't saying cut spending. They're saying, oh, this group so much needs help and this program is so good. 99% of the testimony they hear is for more spending. Right, and I think it's time for an advocacy organization on the other side of that equation to show that there's actually a movement of people out there who care about this issue enough to vote on it.